Well, hello, and thank you for joining with me as we continue our look at Second Peter. We are in verse 6, and uh, I would just like to say as kind of an aside that uh, this is the great time of year to live in the Pacific Northwest. The, the temperatures are very moderate. We don't get a lot of rain occasionally, but not all the time. Uh, it, the temperatures, as I said, are very moderate, between 78 degrees. We have literally a limited amount of insects, unlike the deep south where this time of year is incredibly humid and you have insects and thunderstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes. Um, we've been, you know, exempted from some of that. Now we pay on the other side. By the time we get into, say, October and November, uh, it'll start snowing and we're freezing our buns off. But in the meantime, it's a nice time of year to be here. And uh, uh, I hope you're enjoying life where you're at as much as I happen to be enjoying it right now. Because some of you know that one of my favorite things to do this time of year is to take my Bible out on the deck and uh, just face the sun and and read the scriptures and spend some time with God out there. Um, I just, you know, I'm a sun lover. I love sun. I'm not a sun worshiper, but I'm a sun lover, and uh, I enjoy it a great deal. So anyway, that's my good news. I hope you're having good news where you're at. But uh, as we pick up our discussion, Peter, Peter's talking about really um, the identity of Christ and our identity within him. And identity is one of those hot button words today that people use quite a bit. Um, and the problem is that we self-identify. We decide what who we are, what we're going to be. And that's not only, although we hear a lot about it, in the idea of the sexual movement, the sexual identities, but in reality, every one of us does it to one degree or another. We formulate fairly early in our mind after some influential personality or persons in our life to identify as a certain type of person. Not altogether bad because there are good role models and unfortunately sometimes there's bad role models. But I think it's worthwhile many times for us, especially as we get older, to kind of step back and ask ourselves the question, uh, where did I derive my sense of myself, of who I am? Now, ideally, that comes from a loving father and mother, a father who is a, a strong leader and, and in many ways, a, a strong disciplinarian. Uh, he's authoritative, not authoritarian. You might want to look up the difference between those two words. But the simple fact is we also have those mothers who love us and, and make us think that uh, we're, we're valuable and lovable and worthwhile. And those kind of combinations of the, uh, the mature, strong, disciplined father and loving, supportive mom kind of help us to develop an identity uh, as a healthy person and to develop it based upon whom we feel God is calling us to become, the, the leadership that he's presiding in our life. Uh, unfortunately, none of us grow up in perfect family units, and so sin is always a factor. It comes sometimes outside, from outside into the family, and sometimes it comes from inside the family. But the reality is, as I've often said to parents, don't expect to raise sinlessly perfect kids because uh, you live in a sinful world, it's filled with sinful people, and you're a sinner. And so your kids are going to struggle with the sin issue, and that's going to affect how they see themselves or kind of lay hold on what is their identity, who they really believe themselves to be. And it's not the idea of creating my own identity as rather as much as discovering who God has created me to be, where he has gifted me, what skills he wants to place in me, what uh, talents he has naturally gifted me with. But most importantly is the gifting that I have from God. I take myself, for example, that uh, there are a lot of things that I am not good at. Uh, you don't want to have me as your car mechanic. Uh, I'm not really good with mechanical stuff. Uh, I discover that even the smallest ways, like putting together things at Christmas time. Um, I seem to always have trouble, mainly because I don't like to take the time to read the instructions. And it seems obvious to me, unfortunately. I'll look at something and say, oh, I know how to do that, and discover in the way that I'm missing some key components components in the process. Some key steps get overlooked. So that's not an area that I've ever felt really gratified in. In fact, you tend to discover where your strengths are, are the areas that really energize you when you do them. So I've learned skills. I have certain musical abilities or skills that I've learned. Uh, I have a moderate degree of uh, musical ability. I have a, a modest amount of, of physical intelligence. I mean, I have pretty quick reactions and so forth, but I'm not a great athlete. I 
just, you know, kind of competent and have never really found that I thrived in that environment a whole lot. Uh, I could get by, but that was about it. But where I found myself really, really uh, flourishing, even when I was in college, was uh, I was fascinated by the facts of history. I was fascinated with the process of logic and philosophy, and those things were very important to me, which is probably why I was heading towards becoming a lawyer before I got saved. But I think most importantly, I realize now that God had really given me a, a predisposition to do things like this that I love to parse the Word of God. I love to look at the scriptures and dig into them and pull passages apart and put them back together and and try to figure out what God's thoughts are when he wrote these words so that I can, as Kepler said, I can really follow God's thoughts. I want to be able to uh, see what he was thinking with a clarity that enables me to begin to adjust my thinking and bring my life into agreement with him. And so, when Paul or Peter says here in, in chapter 2, verse 6 of First Peter, he says, For Scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion. He begins by giving this interesting identification of Jesus as being the stone. And we'll find that he's referred to as the foundation stone. He's referred to as the cornerstone. He's referred to the capstone all which have their own specific and, and important meaning in understanding who Jesus is. But before I get away from talking about your identity, I just want to kind of hook this into the conversation that part of really discovering who I am and what's my proper identity is by beginning to discover who Jesus is and identifying him properly. See, false doctrine always goes in one of two directions. It either underestimates Jesus or it overestimates him. Now, you may say, how can you overestimate Jesus? Well, uh, the Gnostic theology taught or presented Jesus as being more like a superhuman hero than being the Son of God. That Jesus walked in humility, and what was amazing to people was that he wasn't particularly good-looking. He wasn't particularly outwardly gifted, as we might think. Uh, I think by nature of the world of those days, he had to have a level of physical fitness. But the whole point is that they, the Gnostics saw Jesus as being a bigger-in-life superhero, kind of like the, the heroic gods of the pagan religions. And so they basically took their concept of God and the Son of God in the pagan religions, and they began to conflate that with Jesus. On the other hand, we have the intellectual approach especially that came out of the Enlightenment in the middle of the 19th century, which reduced Jesus just to simply a good man, a moral teacher, uh, but didn't really take him seriously as God incarnate. And so it's important for us to understand who he is. And that's where Peter begins by saying who Jesus is. He is the stone upon which Zion, which means the, the house of God, the place of God, the mountain of God, upon which the whole plan of God, if you will, was founded. Now, here's what's kind of the interesting side note is when it describes Jesus' occupation, it, it, we translate it as being a carpenter because, you know, uh, the English translations which were made in Eastern or Western Europe had basically wood to work with, and that's why the creche is sewn as being a, a wood structure the same way with, a, with a, uh, the crib is a basically a, a wood structure. But if you live in the Middle East and you've been there, you realize that everything pretty much is made of stone because there's not much wood there. And the word technon doesn't mean a carpenter, it means a craftsman. In other words, these are people who were gifted in working with the materials they had at hand. And one of the primary materials, the primary material they worked with was stones and stone cutting. And so it's interesting because we find when Jesus makes reference when he says, I build my church on this rock. These kind of references kind of suggest to us that he was familiar with that world of cutting and shaping and forming stones. And so when we see Jesus being the chief cornerstone in Zion, he is the center of God's focus. And he also is really the, the heart, the beginning and the end of his divine narrative. And so when we find the disciples coming to Jerusalem, one of those key moments in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, uh, we find that they're walking by the temple and the comment from the disciples, possibly Peter, was, uh, look at these stones. Because if you see the remains of the Temple Mount today, you'll recognize that 
It's a massive stone cut structure that was built uh, in, in creating a great cavernous covering for which the temple was built on top. And everything was made of stone and decorated maybe with precious metals, but they were all made of stones, carefully cut and formed and shaped to fit into exact positions. I mean, the exactness of the cutting of the stones is one of the marvels of the Temple Mount, and it partly explains not only by its size, but also its survivability because it was put together with such carefulness. But as they looked at these amazing, majestic stones that were made the, in the temple, perfectly tra crafted and powerfully placed, and as a consequence being unshakable, he basically says, we need to understand that this is who Jesus is. He is the foundation upon which our lives are built, and that's where we're going to find our strength. That's where we're gonna find our sustainability. But we'll get into this more in detail as we continue on tomorrow talking more about this stone uh, idiom that's used repeatedly, especially in Peter, to describe who Jesus is. Blessings.